Tonight, anarchy in Guinea. More than 15 people killed and scores injured as the Southwest Pacific nation rolls into chaos due to a pay issue. Ill discipline in police force will not be tolerated. Australia says it is standing by to assist if the Australian military is needed. We haven't had any requests uh, from the PNG government. Trump knows Chris goes. Trump critic Chris Christie bids adieu to his presidential dreams. That there isn't a path for me to win the nomination. While frontrunner former President Donald Trump says he already has picked his VP. Really? I mean, I know who it's going to be. Give us a hand. I'll give you, we'll do another show sometime. So ring stocks. Japan's Nikkei breaches 35,000 for the first time in 34 years. Gains on Wall Street and the weaker yen in relation to the dollar are some of the short-term triggers. And bad doggy. Someone did something wrong. Guess what? All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us right here on World News Tonight. I appreciate your company. Let me take you straight to uh, Papua New Guinea. As the island nation in the southwest of Pacific broke into anarchy today, the Papua New Guinea government is working to restore order after at least 15 people were reportedly killed during rioting and looting that left the country's two biggest cities in flames. The unrest began in the capital Port Moresby yesterday after hundreds of police officers, soldiers, prison staff and public servants went on a strike in a pay dispute. The Papua New Guinea government has attributed a pay cut to an administrative glitch. At least 15 people were killed in deadly riots in Papua New Guinea, according to Australian media ABC on Thursday. Eyewitnesses filmed buildings ablaze in the capital city Port Moresby on Wednesday night. The unrest stemmed from police officers going on strike that morning. That's after they discovered a reduction in their pay packets, which the government blamed on an administrative error. The protest spun out of control and descended into lawlessness. Drone footage on Wednesday showed widespread looting in the capital. The country's Prime Minister, James Marape, criticized insubordination among the ranks. Ill discipline in police force will not be tolerated. Ill discipline in defense will not be tolerated. Uh, you can have one moment in the sunlight, uh, but these moments will not last forever. Smoke still billowed over burning buildings on Thursday. The U.S. Embassy in Port Moresby said police had returned to work, but tensions remained high. The Chinese embassy noted several Chinese nationals were injured and some Chinese-owned stores were looted. Australia said it's keeping a close eye on the situation, though Canberra says it hasn't received any requests for help from Papua New Guinea, which regularly supports in policing and security. Well, Chinese President Xi Jinping held in-depth talks with his Maldivian counterpart, Mohamed Mazur, following which the two countries signed 20 key agreements, including one on tourism cooperation. During this event, the two countries also announced the elevation of their bilateral ties to a comprehensive strategic cooperation partnership. President Xi Jinping called President Mohamed Mizu of the Maldives an old friend on his first state visit to China on Wednesday. It's a sign of an upgraded relationship between the two countries, as China sets the stage for further investment in the Indian Ocean archipelago by agreeing to a comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership. Muzu took office in November after winning on his India Out platform, in which he cast China's regional rival as a threat to sovereignty. His government has since asked dozens of locally-based Indian military personnel to leave while talking up opportunities for Chinese investors, despite already owing Beijing around $1.4 billion. Relations between India and China nosedived after both sides clashed in the Western Himalayas in 2020, resulting in the death of 20 Indian soldiers and four Chinese troops. The relationship between the Maldives and India further soured over the weekend, after three now-suspended deputy ministers from the island nation disparaged India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi on social media. 
On Monday, one of India's largest travel platforms suspended flight bookings to the tourism-dependent country. She said he backed increasing the number of direct flights between the two countries in a potential boon for the Maldives' travel and tourism sector. The Maldives owes around 20 percent of its public debt to China, according to World Bank data, making Beijing its biggest bilateral creditor ahead of Saudi Arabia and India, which it owes over $120 million to each. Let's get you the latest on the road to the White House. Well, the dropping game has begun in the Republican nomination race before the first caucus takes place next Monday. This time, Chris Christie, who never had a chance uh, from the get-go, accepted he won't be seeking the nomination nod from the Republican Party anymore. Now, during his exit event, he was also caught on a hot mic where his confidence in Nikki Haley was made known. Chris Christie announcing the end of his long-shot presidential bid, just five days before the first contest of the Republican primary. It's clear to me tonight that there isn't a path for me to win the nomination, which is why I'm suspending my campaign tonight for president of the United States. The most vocal Trump critic in the GOP field, the former New Jersey governor had focused his campaign on New Hampshire, but struggled to gain traction. I am going to make sure that in no way do I enable Donald Trump to ever be president of the United States again. And that's more important than my own personal ambition. And while Christie made no endorsement tonight, he already faces pressure to back Nikki Haley, whom he has publicly defended in the past, but has repeatedly criticized in recent days, including for not taking on Trump more directly. When you ask her the tough questions, she doesn't answer. Christie appearing to criticize her on a hot mic before his event began tonight. And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. On social media, Trump calling that a, quote, very truthful statement. Christie's exit could give Haley a boost in New Hampshire, where polls show her closing the gap with Trump, and where a recent poll shows roughly half of Christie's supporters listing Haley as their second choice. The two former governors sharing an appeal to similarly moderate and independent voters like Zach Clares, who voted for Joe Biden in 2020. So the two remaining contenders alongside frontrunner former President Donald J. Trump, uh, that's Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, were at each other's throats at the final presidential debate before the first caucus. CNN hosted the final debate. Nikki Haley's running to pursue her donors' issues. I'm running to pursue your issues. So what we're going to do is rather than have him go and tell you all these lies, you can go to DeSantisLies.com. It will cover the fact that he's only mad about the donors because the donors used to be with him, but they're no longer with him now. And that's because he's upset about the fact that his, his campaign is exploding. The difference between... Uh, Nikki Haley and me, you know, I listened to all that litany of stuff. You know, I debated the governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Um, you know, I thought he lied a lot. Uh, man, Nikki Haley may, gives him a run for his money, and she may even be more liberal than Gavin Newsom is. I wish Donald Trump was up here on this stage. He's the one that I'm running against. He's the one that I wish would be here. He needs to be defending his record. Do not trust Nikki Haley with illegal immigration. That's like having the fox guard the hen house. She's weak on immigration. She's bankrolled by people who want open borders and she said there shouldn't be a limit on immigration. You should work with corporate CEOs. Thanks. We have to realize my parents came here illegally. They came the right way 50 years ago. They put in the time, they put in the price. They are offended by what's happening on the border. So the only person who has a real chance of clinching the nomination of the Republican presidential race is former President Donald J. Trump who says that he has already picked his vice presidential candidate. He mentioned this at a town hall meeting broadcast by Fox News to overshadow the Republican debate on CNN. Who would be in the running for vice president? Well, I can't tell you that, really. I mean, I know who it's going to you be. Give us a hint. I'll give you, we'll do another show sometime. Well, what about any of the people who you've run against? Would you be open to mending fences with oh, any sure, of them? Oh, sure, I will, I will. I've already started like Christy better. He had a hot mic where he was talking to somebody about uh, the weather, and he happened to say that she doesn't have what it takes. She'll be creamed in the 
in the election. And I mean, I know her very well, and I happen to believe that Chris Christie is right. That's one of the few things he's been right about, actually. <laughs> well, you know, you have Democrats in New Hampshire, and they vote. And you have independents in New Hampshire in large numbers, and they vote. And I have polls that show me leading by a tremendous amount in New Hampshire and a lot in Iowa and nationwide. We're leading by almost 60 points. So I'm not exactly worried about it. I understand New Hampshire very well. I've won it twice and did very well with New Hampshire. I love the people. They love me, I think. Let's take a short commercial break. More well news right after this. Welcome back, everyone, to World News. Now, much of the United States was continuing to grapple with a mixed bag of unsettled weather, snow, rain, strong winds, flooding, and freezing temperatures that had upended daily life for millions of people from coast to coast. Now, some pockets of the United States experienced improved conditions, while others were again battling the rain, wind, and snow. Powerful winter weather storms and heavy rains continued across the central and eastern United States. Over 418 homes and businesses in 12 states are without power ahead of a brutal freeze that is expected to blanket the region starting this weekend. The current storm is covering most of the country east of the Mississippi River and is moving toward the U.S. northeast. Winter storms covered parts of the central United States, leaving roads, farmlands and vehicles covered in thick snow. Major cities such as New York, Philadelphia and Boston see flood-inducing rains taper off and potentially damaging gusts of more than 50 miles per hour that could take down trees and power lines during the day. The storm is coming ahead of what will likely be the nation's coldest weather since December 2022. Our Russian President Vladimir Putin says that Europe needs Russia more than his country needs the EU bloc. He made these remarks while visiting a regional town in eastern Russia on a first ever presidential visit to the region. Following that story for us tonight is Adha Dhiranar's uh, Simashi Pereira who is in Moscow and joins me via Zoom with the latest. Simashi. Mahesh, Russian President Vladimir Putin said that the country has shown true resilience by not bowing to foreign pressure. He stated that Russia is a self-sufficient country whose economy is growing despite the sanctions, while EU member states are living through difficult times. The president made his remark during a meeting with the residents of Russia's far eastern region of Chukotka. Among other things, Putin was asked about threats received by a local volunteer group that supports the country's military aim at the ongoing conflict with Ukraine. The president noted that Russia has regularly received threats from abroad, but this does not scare us. He advised the EU to instead focus on their domestic issues. This comes as the states, United States and seven other nations accuse Russia of exploiting its position as a permanent member of UN Security Council by acquiring North Korea's missiles and firing them into Ukraine in violation of Council resolutions. Back to you, Mahesh. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Simashi Pereira, other than a special correspondent reporting from Moscow, Russia. Appreciate that. Well, Japan's stocks were higher after the close today as gains in the precision instrument, transportation equipment and services sector led share, shares higher. Now, at the close in Tokyo, the Nikkei 225 rose 1.88% to hit a new 34-year high. Japanese stocks are soaring to highs not seen for decades. On Thursday, the benchmark Nikkei index rose around 2% to pass the 35,000 level. That's its highest since February 1990. Perhaps surprisingly, Japan's tough start to the year is one factor. The country suffered a major earthquake on New Year's Day. Over 200 people have so far been confirmed dead. That all left investors in subdued mood, but also made them rethink when the Bank of Japan will finally start raising rates. Many think any move will now be delayed. BOJ Governor Kazuo Ueda will also be watching the data. He has said he won't move on rates until he sees signs that wages are consistently tightening. 
Yet figures out this week actually showed real wages shrinking for a 20th straight month in November. Those numbers sent the Japanese yen lower against the dollar overnight, which also helped stocks, as the weaker currency boosts the value of overseas earnings for exporters. Hitachi, Suzuki Motor and trading house Itochu were among the day's big gainers as a result, all up around 4% in afternoon trade. Let's take you to Argentina now. The IMF has agreed to disburse $4.7 billion to Argentina despite the country's failure to meet the terms of its $43 billion loan in recent months, offering a crucial lifeline to new libertarian president uh, Jair Millet as he pursues uh, ambitious uh, reforms. Now the money includes a $3.3 billion tranche of the loan that had been due to uh, due to be dispersed in November, which was delayed by Milley's inauguration in December, and $1.4 billion that the IMF agreed to disperse ahead of schedule. Argentina and the International Monetary Fund have struck a deal to rescue the country's embattled debt program. The agreement should unlock around $4.7 billion in funding. Agreement was urgently needed. Argentina is battling inflation heading towards 200% and is short of foreign currency reserves. Meanwhile, the IMF loans had been on hold after the previous government missed economic targets linked to the programme. The new administration of libertarian President Javier Millet had been locked in talks with the fund since late last week. Caputo welcomed the agreement, but also said Argentina shouldn't rely on it. For now, the IMF deal looks like a timely win for Millet, who faces daunting economic challenges. He came to power promising to cut spending, slash bureaucracy and free up business. But his program of deregulation is proving divisive on the streets and in Congress, where he lacks the majority needed to drive through reforms. Let's take you to the United Kingdom now. Keir Starmer, the UK opposition leader, has branded British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak Mr. Nobody, mocking the Prime Minister for abrupt flip-flops on his election strategy. Now, speaking during PMQs yesterday, the Labour leader said Sunak had begun 2024 with new year, new nonsense. Following the upcoming general election in the UK's other veterans, Helen Helapitia, who's joining me and Well, Mahesh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he is working on the assumption that he will hold a general election in the second half of the year. In recent weeks, there has been speculation he might call on in May when there are local elections. Labour leader Sir Keir Stammer accused him of squatting in Downing Street for months on end, deterring and delaying while the country wants a change. He said both the country and Labour Party were ready for an election. British Prime Minister Rishik Sunak urged voters that he won party today to stick to the plan for long-term change. Sunak has so far struggled to make progress on his main pledges and heads, uh, heads a deeply fractious party, with some lawmakers threatening to out him unless he cuts more taxes he has hit one target of having inflation by the end of 2023 a goal economists say that has little to do with government policy mahish all right helene hella pt other than a special correspondent reporting from manchester in the uk thank you very much let's take a short commercial break more world news right after this Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Elvis made a comeback in Las Vegas. No, he did not come back to life. But new AI technology managed to do that for the rest of us. The annual Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas had some really interesting tech gear that would certainly change our lives in the near future. Artificial intelligence is the hot topic at this year's CES Gadget Show in Las Vegas. Dozens of firms are making pitches from an AI-powered dashboard from Mercedes-Benz to robotic aids for athletes. Samsung is getting in on the action too with an AI-powered home robot. 
dubbed Bali. It can follow its owner around and operate some household appliances. Chief Executive Han Zhang He says the tech is no fad. AI is helping Elvis make a virtual comeback. British firm Layered Reality has used the tech to create a new performance from material, including hours of Elvis's home videos. The virtual reality show will debut in London. Well, astronomers have traced one of the most powerful and distant uh, fast radio bursts ever detected back to its usual cosmic home, a rare blob-like group of galaxies. The unexpected discovery uh, could shed more light on what causes the mysterious radio wave burst which had puzzled scientists for years. The intense signal, named uh, FRB 2022-06-10A, was first de detected uh, on June 10th of 2022 and it travelled 8 billion light years to reach Earth. Well, you heard the excuse, the dog ate my homework, but now it's the dog ate my money. Harry and Clayton Law love their seven-year-old golden doodle named Cecil, even after Cecil ate $4,000 in cash. I was like, he ate the money, he ate the $4,000. The cash lay on the kitchen counter. It was money to pay for a new outdoor fence. Cecil apparently found the cash just too appetizing to ignore. He gobbled it all up. Then Cecil started throwing up. As I went to clean it, I realized there was like chunks of hundreds and fifties. Once we realized like it was in his system and it was coming out one end, I was like, well, he normally goes number two twice a day. So I'm like, I should follow him and just see if anything comes out. We just had to kind of get to work. We put on some masks and gloves. Bank was able to replace most, but not all of the bills. Here's one that's been partially uh, taped back together. The bank wouldn't take this because it's missing oh, no. the serial number on this side. So what was so delicious about all that cash? So I called the bank and they said, this actually happens more than you would think. Money goes through so many like restaurants and it touches so many hands and it just acquires all of these smells. And so dogs really like the smell of money. Just like the rest of us. Not a fan of dogs. Maybe this is one of the reasons. The, the question I have is if he ate $4,000 and, you know, basically he only coughed up $3,500, that dog kept a $500 tip. For what? Maybe to sneak out of that house? Well, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition of World News. See you then. Bye. -bye.